Okay, welcome back to the next installment of materials. And so today we're going to look at creep and wear. And creep is simply high temperature irreversible deformation, and wear is going to be um, surface damage produced by moving surfaces in contact. So we want to identify the primary mechanisms of creep, what's going on in the material. Um, you need to, after this uh, discussion, be able to determine the temperature at which creep becomes an issue for any material with, with a known melting temperature. We're going to talk about determining creep model parameters and um, doing some of that model building, model fitting, and then you should be able to use a creep rupture curve. So what is creep? It's simply time-dependent permanent deformation. The idea is at a constant stress, strain continues to increase. Strain is not um, does not arrest as it does, say, an elastic a deformation. We apply a stress, you get a strain level, and then no, no more. So if you look at this schematically, we apply a stress. We can say commonly in a creep test, we apply a step function. And we're going to hold that over time. And what we see in the strain is no strain until we apply the stress. And we get an instantaneous, that's your elastic strain. And then over time, the strain grows, it continues to grow. When I remove the stress, we remove the elastic strain, and we're left with a permanent strain which is the plastic creep strain. All right, so that's the phenomena, and we'll play with silly putty, and you'll see that in class. And there's really th several different things that contribute to creep. It's actually quite complicated, um, and we always want to talk about it in, in simple terms here. You get very high rates of diffusion that allows crystals to reshape to kind of reduce their strain energy. They're relieving the stress. Um, the fusion at grain boundaries and in the bulk uh, is going to feed this. And then you're also going to have uh, dislocations doing stuff they couldn't do at, at normal temperatures because the high energy that's present and the weak bonds, because we're at high, te high temperatures, we're going to allow dislocations to climb, to move around things that blocked them before. And, and so we'll see a resumption of dislocation. Now, we can map those mechanisms with this wonderful universal map. It's good for all crystalline materials, or at least, yeah polycrystal materials because we have we have boundaries here we're going to be talking about. But um, this is normalized. So this is the applied stress divided by the shear modulus. So we have no units here. And this is the actual temperature divided by the melting temperature of the material. Both of these must be in Kelvin. Now if they're both in Kelvin then at one we are at the melting temperature and obviously we have no more material. And so this is a map of the mechanisms of deformation. So at low temperatures and low stresses, we have elastic deformation. At the yield strength, we get conventional plastic flow. And so that is, this is where we've been working in our stress strain curves. Elastic deformation as the stress increases and we hit the yield strength, bang, we get conventional plastic deformation. And above the yield strength, we're going to have conventional plastic flow for all materials. If we're above the yield strength, you're just going to get dislocations or twins, whichever are the dominant mechanism. Now, at elevated temperature, let's say at about 40% of TM, 0.4, we begin to get dislocation creep. And there's two several different mechanisms, and we're not going to go through those. But this is the new movement or additional movement of dislocations under stress that had uh, been arrested before. And so we begin to get plastic deformation by dislocation creep. Even though we're well below the yield strength, you could be way down here. You know, this is uh, well, not even, what is that, about 10%, less than 10% of the, uh, it's about 5% of the uh, yield strength. And then down here at lower stress levels, we have significant diffusional flow. And the diffusion is either on the boundaries, happening on the grain boundaries, or it's going through the bulk in this little section here at really high temperatures. So obviously, right away, we see, oh, this, this is a creep process that kicks in at fairly low, at any temperature and very low stresses. And so as we get to higher and higher stresses, obviously it's more and more an issue. But if our design stress is 5 or 10% of yield, even, even if we're here, then we're about like 1 8 we're still going to have this permanent flow or permanent deformation just due to diffusion. And at higher stresses, this is going on, and so it's going to be adding to the amount of creep that we get. So we're going to want to attack that here at some point. Now, a classic creep test, usually a tensile bar, you apply a dead load, strains plotted versus time, it ruptures at the end. 
And you have instantaneous strain, primary strain, secondary strain, and tertiary strain. And so in this secondary region, just like we did with fatigue, we can take the logs, we can find a slope, we can get the equation of a line, and we can get a growth law. What is my velocity of strain as a function of time? And then if we do this at several different stress levels, we can get a law that tells me velocity of the strain, how much it's creeping as a function of stress. Okay, and, uh, and so we can then figure out what's going on as a function of time. Now, steady state creep rate comes out of that secondary creep. And we're going to, turns out that you can modify that rate, or the rate of creep depends on the Arrhenius model. No surprise, it's diffusion. And so Arrhenius, the, remember back to the number of vacancies or the diffusivity calculation, those are Arrhenius forms. And what you're going to need to do to find the material parameters is you have to do tests at different temperatures, different stress levels to find what your need, what you need. But these are the creep constitutive models. So DEDT, this is the strain per time. This is the velocity of the strain. In the most general sense, the velocity of the strain is equal is proportional through a constant proportionality to the stress to some power n times e to the negative qc over rt. This is the activation energy for creep, ideal gas constant temperature in Kelvin. All right, so how many material constants here? K2, n, and qc. So you have three material constants needed for the general model. Now, if temperature is a constant that you're doing your testing at the temperature you're going to be operating, then the model simplifies. Your velocity is simply a different pre-exponential, and the same n Sigma to the n will be the same at a, at a given temperature. But what happens at a given temperature is you have one value for this times k2, and it gives you your k1. OK. So we're going to, in class, look at how we find these missing constants. But you should look at this and go, oh, that's really easy. We're going to take the natural log of both sides. That's going to give me ln k2 plus n ln sigma minus QC over RT, that's a linear equation and three unknowns, do three experiments, plug and chug, right, algebra. But we're going to do that in class and we'll use this equation um, in the lecture. Now, what if you don't really care about how much strain has occurred? Um, you care how much strain has happened if you have moving components. Let's say you have turbine blades inside of a uh, combustion turbine, gas turbine that you're running a power plant with or a jet engine. And those blades are spinning very fast, which means there's a lot of tensile stress on them due to centripetal acceleration. Um, that is going to cause them to try to elongate. And then you're burning stuff around them, so they're flaming hot, literally. And therefore, they tend to creep, and they get longer. But when they get longer, they rub against the outside of the turbine, the inner wall of the, the shell of the turbine. So obviously, this is a bad deal. And you're going to use those creep models to predict how long you can operate the engine and how much how much creep you're going to get and so on. But what if you don't really care? What if you just have tubes in a boiler and you're running superheated steam through the tubes and they're creeping under pressure. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. All you really care about is when they're going to burst. And uh, you just want to stop things before they burst and spray steam into your combustion unit and cause all kinds of problems. So we use what are called creep rupture curves. And they've just done a ton of experiments. And they plot the applied stress versus time to rupture for different temperatures. And you simply come in. You're operating at temperature 1. Here's your applied stress. All right, it's going to last that long. And so you're going to just read the graph to get rupture time. So that's a very easy method for dealing with creep. Now, the threshold for creep is, if we go back to our mechanism chart, you see that creep doesn't really begin until high stress is at about 40% of TM. So that's our threshold, 40% of the melting temperature. Now, that means if temperature is greater than that, you're going to get creep. If it's less than that, nothing happens. So let's look at an example. Lead products, well, they creep at room temperature. Is lead a creepy material? But it is health re for health reasons, but it also is because of um, it's low melting point. The melting point is 327C, which is 600 Kelvin. Room temperature is 23C, which is 296 Kelvin. You take the ratio there, 296 over 600 is 49% or 0.493. That's more than 0.4, so lead creeps very nicely at room temperature. And, uh, it's not a structural material. The important reason it's not is because of that creep.
Another way to think about what this means is how cold does your freezer need to be if you don't want the ice cubes creeping? No ice cube parties. Well, what's the freezing point of water? It's 273 Kelvin. What's 0 0.4 of 273? 109 degrees Kelvin, which is minus 164 degrees C. Your freezer at home is a flaming furnace for the ice because you're only 10 degrees, usually 10 degrees Celsius, below the melting temperature of the ice. So there's a lot of activity going on, and in fact, you could go put a C-clamp on an ice cube and go in and tighten it every day a little bit, and you can eventually embed the C-clamp in the ice cube. The creep of the ice will allow that to happen. Um, there were aircraft that have been landed on ice flows, and if you just leave them on the ice, they will gradually embed themselves, bury themselves in the ice their own weight. So creep is an issue because at terrestrial temperatures, even at, even at the North Pole, where you're talking maybe minus 40 or minus 50 C, you're still 120 degrees above the threshold for creep. So it's um, ice is not particularly stable. And in fact, that leads to research, and there's been a lot of work done on the creep behavior of ice. And people do this, have looked at this because of uh, the need to model behavior of ice for weather models and for ship design. If you're going to be busting through ice, you need to know what its properties are. And so there's been serious government money spent on the creep behavior of ice. So here's your strain rate, epsilon, um, DE, DT, and here's the shear stress. And they're using an octahedral, which we don't, you don't know what that is yet, but it's a way to combine the different stress components into one number. So how do we deal with creep? Well, one common thing is to re reduce the effect of grain boundaries. Get rid of that diffusion along the grain boundaries. We use single crystals. So we have uh, here alloys that are used in turbines. And the yellow outlines are single crystal versions. So here's CM186 and the single crystal version of the blue line, which is, I'm sorry, of the pink line, which is um, the uh, multi, the, sorry, which one is this? Yeah, uh, this is the polycrystalline material. Anyway, so what you see is that for a given rupture life, Okay, the yellow line, I can be much significantly higher. This is a log scale, so you know, that may be twice as strong. Um, or for a given stress, they don't even overlap, do they? Okay. So it was just tremendous improvement in the properties because we went to single crystal. So here's an application, uh, a turboprop engine. And um, this is one of the vein doublets in the, uh, in the turbine the combustion stage, or first stage. Uh, and you notice something else about this, and this is the second way that we can prevent creep. These little airfoils that the air is running over um, are hollow, and they have holes in the leading edges. And we can do that for uh, a lot of the blades. And what you can do is take air that's being sucked in and compressed and bleed it into the combustion chamber through those little vents on the blades. And when you do that, you're cooling the blade. So we can use active crystals or active cooling we change the operating conditions essentially by doing that. Obviously we change materials. You go to higher melting alloys and you're going to resist creep um, because of that. So several strategies for dealing with creep. Um, and you just have to do what you can. The best thing is to pick a material that's not going to have issues. Um, making single crystals is possible but is uh, quite expensive. So we only do that where we have to. Okay, let's talk about wear. Wear is simply surface damage that's produced by sliding of uh, surfaces over each other. And there's three major mechanisms. And there's subdivisions within these. And we'll look at some uh, more detailed wear maps for polymers in class. But three mechanisms are adhesive wear, abrasive wear, and fretting wear. And uh, adhesive wear. You have surfaces that are sliding, and when you zoom in on any surface, it's actually not smooth. At a, at a small enough scale, a fine enough scale, you have surface roughness, and these are called asperities. Now, as the surface slides, these asperities contact. When they contact, they, this bangs here, and this one bangs into that. If they are compatible, they weld. They're going to fuse into a single piece. 
As you continue to slide them, you break those welds and in the process probably lose some material. You may transfer the material from one to the other, but you're also going to have some of it just disappear, come loose from the surface. So this requires compatible materials. Now what does compatible mean? Well, here is a design chart from the Machine Elements text that uh, tells you if materials are um, going to be good uh, in opposition to each other uh, in terms of resisting wear. And identical metals are not good. They're always going to wear. So those are these open circles. And um, what you notice here is materials are better. The, the more pie you have left in the pie pan, the better they are. So these little dots, those are terrible. They have very high compatibility. You're going to have a lot of wear. The best ones are black circles, two liquid. You know, this is filled in. That's a good thing to put against. So nickel against silver is actually going to have very, very low wear due to adhesion. But notice what the what this says. The criteria are for these circles: solid solubility above one percent. Remember the four rules. Um, we may be violating them, but we're not violating them so badly that we can at least dissolve one percent of one element in the other. But what we're doing is, as you drop down to this ideal, which would be the black circles, we're getting less and less solid solubility. And in fact, at this level, we get liquid phase, single liquid phase, but no, but very, very low solid solubility. And in the extreme case, they don't even mix as liquids, let alone as solids. So they are completely incompatible elements. And what you notice is that a couple of these guys are really champions. Lead is really good against a lot of things. And lead has historically been pretty heavily used as an additive to prevent wear in sliding contact situations. The other thing you can do is you can lubricate. And what lubricants do is they get in between the two metals and they prevent them from touching, actually. In the ideal, you get full hydrodynamic lubrication the two metal surfaces never are in contact. Polishing also helps because polishing gets rid of the tall asperities. It spreads the contact over more points, reducing the local stress on those points, perhaps, and reducing then the likelihood that they're going to weld. So which material would have low wear against iron? Why don't you pause the video for a second, see if you can figure out which one it is. OK, if you're back now. Obviously, you're back now. If we look against iron, um, and so you find iron is here, but let's look at him here, okay, on this column. And um, your zinc is right here, so that one's not good. Um, aluminum's here, that one's also not good. Indium's up here, and ah, that's a black circle. And then niobium down here, and that's also not good. So obviously, indium is the answer because there are two liquid phases. Indium, unfortunately, is fairly expensive. It's a cousin of lead, and, but more pricey. OK, so that's how we deal with adhesive wear. We try to use incompatible metals. For abrasive wear, another name for this is three-body wear. And that the problem is these particles now, um, or other contaminants, between the surfaces um, are hard, mostly oxide materials. And so if they get banged between the surfaces, they're going to dig in and tear away material. And of course, how do we prevent three-body wear? You're going to usually use things like oil filters okay, to remove the debris uh, from your lubricant stream. And, uh, and that will then stop or shut down the three-body wear. And then threading wear, fretting wear is where you have parts in contact that may or may not be compatible. And we get very small relative motions. They're not sliding. They're just oscillating a very, very small amount. And you get micro welding and then breakage, and that causes, it causes spot damage. Now, you're not going to have large amounts of material loss, but fretting is insidious because it's microscopic surface damage that can lead to fatigue crack formation. So your beautifully polished parts are now ruined because of fretting. Uh, this is common in a pro common problem in shipping of precision parts. You polish them in the factory, then you pack them badly and ship them, and they bang into other parts in the uh, crate. And you get surface damage, and then that leads to failure of somebody's crank somewhere down the road in their, in their engine or whatever. So you'll find that these beautiful, uh, if you've bought a new cam for your car as you're souping up the engine, the cams will usually come wrapped in bubble wrap very carefully because they're highly polished. And if they rub against other metal parts, you could get this fretting damage, which is going to cause uh, 
possibly be an origin for a fatigue failure. Okay, and so there we are. We're finished with uh, creep and wear. We will be doing a number of creep problems in class, and in general, all we're going to do with wear is you should be able to identify materials that are compatible that will reduce the wear um, due to adhesion. So until next time, have a good day.